congregation will meet tomorrow night. So if you're not able to make it, you can listen in that way and do that. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 27, verses 4 through 6. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His ta tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to repair hearts to do just that this evening. Let us pray.
He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair there can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live with him. Let's continue praising our God, taking comfort that we are worshiping a forgiving God by singing 254, Remember Not, O God, 254. Later on, however, 
It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no root or bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that we, what cannot be shaken, may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. Before we come to our God in prayer, the requests or, or praises, our God delights to listen. I learned this afternoon that Gerald's vitals are all still stable, so we pray that he to not get it any more serious and to regain his health.
pray for the people who are traveling, pray for safety on the roads, but also health. A blessed fellowship wherever they're going. Pray for the Yolens family. Central America had uh, two hurricanes come in basically four days apart on the same path. There's a lot of a lot of death and destruction that they're dealing with there. Pray right for them and the church in that area as well. Let us come to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have the whole world. Dealing with 
more worn. We're being stretched thin. We're frustrated with all the masking and personal protective equipment, even when they, they see that it can help in ways. Or encourage their spirits, give them strength to continue ministry. Or give them moments of joy as they serve. That your people serving in the medical field in whatever position janitors all the way up to the doctors might, might be the hands and feet of Christ ministering in the name of Christ and offering words of hope where they can share the gospel as they can God Almighty we pray for Carol Rosenblum as he deals with being sick with this COVID virus or he's already weak. He's already discouraged. He and Geneva has been, have been wrestling, grieving and lamenting, not being able to be in the same room, not being able to, to share a bed as they've had done for so many years of their marriage, now being separate again. What did you Sustain them. Or we think the same for Mary, if you're a friend, Jean, as they deal with being in two places, differing ability to visit and sit, talk, or just be present with each other, or to encourage them, hold them fast, encourage their families as they seek to comfort them. God Almighty, we pray for the Oakham's family as they buried a mother this week. They said goodbye to a, a grandma and a great grandma, a sister in Christ. Lord, hold fast to the empty tomb before them, the risen Savior Jesus Christ in their vision. One from whom not even death can separate them. Give them peace in the midst of that. Lord, with Thanksgiving coming up on Thursday, we pray for those traveling. We pray for safety on the roads, the air. We pray for health. We pray for blessed fellowship, the time of remembering. That in Christ we have all we need, but our cups run over. We have so much more than we need. Heavenly Father, we also think of our congregational meeting tomorrow night. Where we pray that you would be there for us as we gather, as we discern who is being called to. Positions of elder and deacon. We talk about financial matters, other issues of importance to the church. We pray that words of truth would be spoken in a gracious way, that would be fruitful and a blessing to our common life together as a congregation. Heavenly Father, we pray for mobility worldwide and their ministry in. Providing a means of transportation for those who cannot walk in the countries of Haiti. And we pray for all the volunteers and the recipients of these cards. That all their work done in your name would honor and glorify you and point people to the love of Jesus. As we long for you to make all things right, that the lame might leap for joy again. That you bring the new heaven and the new earth. God Almighty, we are your people, and you are our God. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In 
Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. All right. Oh. Song before we come to God's Word is from the Blue Hymnal, number 406. Wonderful Words of Life, number 406. Christ is the end of the law so 
that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching? How can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voices gone out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. Again I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to an disobedient and an obstinate people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have the saying, Miss the forest for the trees. And when we talk about that usually in the, in the setting where someone is so focused on the details that they miss the big picture. Or they're so focused on something they get tunnel vision and don't notice things around them. There's a, a humorous video uh, experiment where these people are sat down to watch a screen. And they're told to watch for a particular person. And in the middle of this video, of this group of people interacting, and they're watching for particular people, at one point a man in a full gorilla suit comes prancing through the room. Just moseying across the screen. And the majority of the people, when asked after, don't see the gorilla walking through the screen. 
They're so focused on trying to find whatever this person was that they were told to look for. They don't see the man in the monkey suit walking past them. And that gets at our human ability to focus on things and miss other things. We miss the forest for the trees. And here in chapter 10, in those first four verses, that's in essence what Paul is saying about the Jews. When they looked at the law, when they looked at the covenant that God made with them at Mount Sinai, they missed the grace. They were so focused on, as Moses describes late in verse 5 there, quoting Leviticus 18, verse 5, the man who does these things will live by them. They were so focused on obeying the law, stay in God's good books, that they missed the fact that even those laws were rooted in God's grace. In God's promise to save them. I mean, how does the Ten Commandments start? Hear, O Israel. The Lord, oh, that's, sorry, that's Deuteronomy 6, the Shema. It starts, I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. Commandments start by God graciously taking his people. And then giving them the law and the sacrifices really as a way for them to deal with their sin by keeping it in front of them and keeping them hoping in God's promised Messiah who would deal with their sin once for all and make them righteous. But as Paul points out here, they got that they needed God. They were zealous for God, but they were so fixated on the law that they couldn't see the righteousness that comes from God. God's righteousness in the flesh, Jesus Christ, who, as Paul points out there in verse 4, is the end of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now what does it mean to be the end of the law? The Greek word is teleos. Meaning the goal. Or the destination. Or a finish line. In other words the law was pointing towards Jesus. It was guiding Israel toward the righteous would perfectly fulfill the law. That's another meaning for that Greek word, the end. It's the, the fulfillment. And that's what Jesus did. He obeyed the law perfectly. And he did so, so that there might be righteousness, the righteousness of God, not for those who do this, but rather, as Paul points out, for everyone who believes. That's what Paul impresses on us. His salvation is by God's sovereign grace. It's God's sovereign power that can lead us to believe. But how are we saved? How do we see it happen humanly? And he points out here in verses 5 through 13 is his righteousness comes to us and is available to everyone who believes. There in verse 6 and 7, Paul is quoting more words from Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30 when Moses is reminding the Israelites of God's gracious covenant before they go into the promised land. And he tells them that you don't need to wonder and scratch your head, but what does God require of us? You don't have to have someone go up the mountain again. You don't have to have someone go down into the deep. But rather, Moses reminds the Israelites there that God's spoken to you. The word is in your mouth. You're supposed to store it on your heart. And Paul takes that and he 
points to the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven. We don't have to go up to heaven to find salvation. Jesus rose from the dead. We don't have to die in order to get our salvation. But rather, as Paul points, righteousness from God comes through the word of faith. To believing in Jesus Christ. And Paul echoes that language from Deuteronomy 30 when Moses said, this word is in your mouth and in your heart. Paul says that's how we're saved. There in verses 9 and and ten. If you confess with your mouth, saying Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he repeats it again there in verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Now, he's not saying there's two stages to salvation here. That we have to believe with our heart and we'll be justified, but if we don't confess with our mouth, we won't be saved. But rather, he's getting at the fact that our salvation is whole body, whole being, you could say. Our, the confession of our mouth only matters if we believe what we're saying deep in our heart. And the belief in our hearts will be made visible if we really believe it through our mouths confessing that Jesus is our Lord. Paul, you can say, presents the, the belief in our hearts and the confession of our lips as two sides of the same coin. This is why we are called to profess the faith. The faith of our fathers and mothers as we sang in our opening hymn this evening. And say, this is my faith too. And the reason we confess this faith is joy for what Paul says there in verses 11 through 13. The scripture says anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all. Call him. For everyone who calls in the name will be saved. Paul is echoing the theme of the letter of Romans that he stated all the way back in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. For in it the righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as written, the righteous will live by faith. What we need to remember about the gospel is that it means I don't have to get my act together first before I can be saved. I don't have to jump through all the right hoops in order to be saved, but rather, I'm called to put my faith in Jesus because He's the one who saves completely and He's the one who will guide me through all the hoops. He is the one who will guide me toward a more righteous, holy life by His power. He is the one who saves us. We don't have to do it for ourselves. That was the stumbling block that Israel stumbled over when it came to Jesus. But we have to do it. Can't just be just trusting in Jesus. That, that's, that's a license to sin. And Paul keeps coming back. No, it's not. Faith in Jesus is what saves us. 
Then Paul moves in verses 14 and 15 to the purpose that we are called, the purpose that some are elect. See, if we ask the question, why is he called me and not another? We have no clue to the answer. But if we ask, for what purpose has he called me? The answer is clear, and we see it right there, verses 14 and 15. We are called in order to be witnesses. <clears throat> How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they preach? Unless they're sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is why we as a, a church support missionaries. We send people to go proclaim. But it is also why each one of us is to see ourselves as missionaries in our neighborhoods. As ambassadors for Christ. Telling people about Jesus in order that they might know that the Spirit might work through us and bring others to faith and salvation in Jesus. Jesus says much the same thing in John chapter 15 when he's talking to his disciples in the upper room. Verse 16 there, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. When we think about election, when we think about us having faith in Jesus by the grace of God, we're to take that not as something that makes us superior than others who do not have faith, but rather we're to take that as a, a call to mission, as a call to be on the team of Christ, making his gospel known through our words and through our actions. Because faith is necessary for us to be saved. That's the distinguishing mark we see there in that last section of the chapter. But not all Israelites accepted the good news. Not all had faith. So Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Paul then quotes the first verse of Psalm 19, which you might think is interesting because that is talking about the heavens declaring the glory of God. But here Paul takes it to say God's special revelation is going out to the ends of the earth as well. Later in the book of Romans, in chapter 15, Paul uses this kind of to the ends of the earth language, the gospel is gone. In verse, chapter 15, verse 20, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And then he continues in verse 23, but now there's no more place for me to work in these regions. I have proclaimed the gospel in every community where there's a gathering of Jews. I've gone to the other cities. He's covered from Jerusalem all the way through Turkey to Greece. Now he's going to go to Rome. And he wants to go to Spain, he says. The Jews, they've heard about Jesus. That's not the issue. The issue is not a lack of understanding either. He quotes those passages from Moses and Isaiah. 
there at the end about making Israel envious and angry by contrasting them with the people who lack understanding. As in, Israel has understanding, they just don't get it. They're so fixed on obeying the law as the path to righteousness that they've missed the whole story of the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus and how he weaves all those threads together and is the end of the law so that righteousness might come to all who believe. Israel understood they needed God. And they thought they knew the way. But they missed Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, the unexpected Gentiles, the people who weren't even looking for God, who didn't know they needed to be saved, are being saved by putting their faith in Jesus. Well, the Jews who know they need God are standing by and getting angry. And what's the distinction? Faith in Jesus. And yet, even here, if you look at verse 21, this passage does end on hope. Now, where's hope in that verse? I've, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Well, here's the hope. God's still holding out his hands. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Today, now is the day of salvation. God is still holding out his hand. The gospel is still being proclaimed. And the Israel, the people of God, according to the flesh, just like the Gentiles who are clueless, have the opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ and be given the righteousness of God that does not come by works of ours, but by the work of Jesus and the Spirit producing faith in us. And so we too are called to hold out the gospel that people might discover as the Spirit softens hearts that God is still holding out his hands to them. As epitomized on the cross, where Jesus reached out to save all who will trust in him. And so we go to the ends of the earth, but also across the street, to tell people about Jesus, that they too might know the hope we have. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came down, that salvation might be near to us, as near as the word we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. We thank you that you rose from the dead. That we might be saved. That we might be given your righteousness instead of the filthy rags we string together by our own works. God Almighty, we pray that those who hear the message would put their faith in Jesus and be saved. We pray that those who have grown up in the church and have heard the message over and over would make it their own by professing with their mouths and believing in their hearts that Jesus is Lord and you have raised him from the dead. 
that in him we can be declared righteous because he took our sin and was condemned under your wrath for it. Oh, what a Savior. Lord, we pray that you would help us to share, that you would make us bold and courageous for the cause of the gospel. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our salvation is in the name. The name of Jesus. And when we when we say the name, we mean everything involving that person. And so as a response, we're going to confess what we believe by singing number 518 in the gray. This setting of the Apostles' Creed, number 518, in God the Father, I believe.